Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have even more stories from all of you magnificent people. We're going to be talking about more stories where research can get messy. So here we go with our first story. I also have a story. I got my first semester biology professor about a lab incident. As a grad student, he was conducting a vivisection of a rat that he had anesthetized with diethyl ether. He was undertaking this in a fume hood, but on the other side of the hood was also being used by another person who was heating a solution over a Bunsen burner. You might see where this is going at this point. You wouldn't think that the flow from the hood would allow the burner on the other side to ignite the ether fumes. I imagine that that was his rationale, but that's exactly what happened. Suddenly the rat was on fire and, and is right next to an open bottle of ether. His first instinct is to get the flames away from the bottle, so in a panic he grabs the flaming rat and throws it across the room, where it slides across the floor into the hallway, right as his department head is walking by. I wish I could tell, no harm was done except for a significant amount of embarrassment. Now, that is absolutely a crazy story, and I think a flaming rat in a research lab and then in a hallway as the head of your department goes by is one of the absolute worst things that could happen. But hey, at least nobody other than the dead rat was harmed. There was a Swedish mycologist who said that if you pick your own mushrooms, you should always leave some untouched. That way your relatives can know what you died of. If you haven't watched any of our mushroom videos so far, you should go check out the video on mushroom mycotoxins. Um, I'm definitely an advocate that only experts pick mushrooms because of uh, consequences that could happen of you consuming them. Currently working on a hospital lab. The most worrying thing that has happened to me is that a time an HIV sample tube blew up in the centrifuge and I had to clean it. I was using gloves, but I was still terrified to be honest. Yeah, I, I don't think I would ever want to work with HIV positive samples. Uh, I don't know why any people need to do that. I think we need to get robots dealing with that and then the robots should be very well sanitized. If you have any good uh, stories about bio contaminations, you know, yes, we're a chemistry channel, but who doesn't love a good biology story? You might think that uh, you're terrified of us biologists out there, but uh, I could guarantee you that the chemists are just as terrified of you as you are of us. Vomitoxin contributed to a collapse of my dad's distillery business. He runs a small distillery producing technical ethanol. He thought he was clever buying up lots of moldy grain on the cheap, and it ruined his relationship with the pig farmers nearby. They used to take from him the silage, the spent grain after fermentation, and they fed it to their pigs. But with moldy grain, it turns out that vomitoxin isn't destroyed by cooking, and the animals got really sick. From then on, no farm was going to take the silage from the distillery ever, not even as a fertilizer. Their company was soon overwhelmed with decomposing silage sludge that they had to dispose of as toxic bio-waste at a huge cost. So, you know, sometimes if you try and cut corners, and if you think you've got a clever solution that nobody's thought of, it's quite possible that you could be wrong. And in this case, many pigs uh, were made sick as a consequence. And that is terrible. If you haven't seen the video on uh, fungal mycotoxins, I'll include a link to that here. When swimming, my go-to solution for preventing my goggles from fogging is to lick them really thoroughly and then rinse with pool water. I have to imagine this would be an awful solution in the lab, though. Yes, please, I hope none of you are licking your lab goggles at any point, whether you're trying to prevent fogging or not. That sounds like an absolutely terrible idea. Imagine a fantasy hero digging up an ancient locked chest, and it's just full of chemical waste. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe if you bury your chemical waste uh, in an approved manner, make sure you don't do it in a treasure chest and you don't paint a big X on the ground above it. You don't want any uh, treasure hunters coming and finding your hidden treasure. I once poured like half a liter of carbon disulfide on my bare hands. It was a cool feeling. Uh, no, that does not sound like a cool feeling. I didn't even have fun reading that. That is absolutely terrible. Do not pour carbon disulfide on your hands. I have had a one gram solution of DMAP, which is 4-dimethylaminopyridine, in dichloromethane fall on my legs, and I'm fine now. If it's as toxic as people say, I imagine that the majority of the DMAP was bound to gold and thus less toxic. If uh, any of you have experience uh, with the actual toxicity of DMAP, I'd be curious to know. MSDS sheets make it seem really terrible and scary, but I don't know of any instances where somebody has died as a consequence of it. If you have a link to a story about the toxicity of DMAP, I would really appreciate it if you could post it in the Discord or comment, and uh, I'll pin the comment down below. Girl in my undergrad lab didn't label her bottles correctly, so instead of putting some more hexanes over her sodium, she had a bottle of water in her hands and poured half of it into the porcelain dish. Into the porcelain dish, it honestly took longer than I would have expected for the sodium to ignite, but soon after catching fire, it exploded into at least 20 smaller burning lumps of sodium. Our sodium comes in sticks. 
But wait, there's more. She put out the fire with sand, which worked well, but then decided to clean up the wet shop towel, igniting the dry, the leftover dry sodium once more. Yes, it's always important when, if you're working with sodium, that every last thing that has come in contact with sodium is slowly quenched. Usually I would use a dilute solution of iso propanol in hexane or isopropanol in mineral oil. And if you do that dilute enough, it's a safe way to quench it. One of my fellow lab students told me this. In one of the early undergrad lab courses, they had to do a reaction with chlorine. Their assistant was helping and everything was fine until a rat came through the venting system into the fume hood. That poor animal died of chlorine poisoning after it took a few steps next to the cylinder. The poor student had to burn the dead rat to ashes because they legally could not get rid of it otherwise. That dying rat was one of the creepiest things he ever saw. Yeah, I, I think if your ventilation system is letting rats move around, you should probably get someone to look into that. Um, rest in peace, rat. You know, if you feel sorry for the rat, make sure you uh, pour out some cola for that poor rat. My story is pretty mild compared to some of the others, but also it is that there is the reason that I do computational chemistry now and do my best to avoid labs. Third semester of undergrad, inorganic chemistry, identifying ions. We had concentrated sulfuric acid prepared in small beakers to use for one of the tests, but all the small beakers were out. So I was instructed to refill the beakers from a two liter glass jar. I was putting it back into the big jar and it clinked on the one next to it and the whole bottom snapped off of it, dumping about 1.5 liters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, luckily only 80% of it went onto the tray in their fume hood and the other 20% onto their lab coat pants and shoes. We were previously told not to use safety showers unless it's really a life or death situation and no one assessed this to be one. So before I finish the story, I'm going to say if you ever get concentrated acid on yourself, absolutely that could be a life or death situation and you should absolutely use showers before it's a life or death situation. There's a lot of bad things that can happen if you get covered in toxic or corrosive chemicals and rinsing it off is always the best idea. Even if you won't die, right, definitely always use safety showers. So I was just sent out by one of the TAs to the bathroom to wash my stuff with a lot of water. Okay, standard procedure. That should not be a standard procedure. You should absolutely get rid of all of the contaminated clothing and not put it back on afterwards. Oh my gosh. Here's the wild part. The professor came in to assess if I'm okay. Yes, just quite shocked. Yeah, then he gave me a new lab coat and told me to go back and finish the lab. I was like, but my pants are also soaking in the sink? She didn't see a problem with that and told me that if I don't finish the lab, then she'll fail me on the course because it's an absence. Mind you, this was 10 minutes before the end anyways. So I went back and finished the lab without pants, just a long lab coat, bare legs out on display, plus shoes that still had some acid on them probably. As my friend says, that sounds like the start of a really bad adult movie. You know, I think it sounds like a lot worse than the start of a bad adult movie. I think this should have got that uh, professor at least reprimanded. That is not acceptable safety practices. And I don't care if you're in a third world country. That is not an acceptable reason to, to like finish a lab. That is so terrible. And I can't believe that. That's awful. When I was a kid, my family brought, bought a truffle pig that turned out to be not very good at his job. The first time we took him out into the woods, he munched down a death cap. Yeah, that, that's not a very good truffle pig. Sorry to hear about that. A former lab mate of mine once synthesized several hundred grams of cyclopropyl 2 ene carboxylic acid, which, if you're not familiar, is also known as tinky winkinic acid. If you're not sure why, I'll include a link to the mushroom mycotoxin video where you can learn more for certain cycloaddition reactions as part of her methodology study. Only after that particular project was she that, that it was over did she realize that the toxicity of this compound was like really bad. She still had lots of it stored in our lab freezer. Luckily we had a trusty ozone generator and we decided to zap it with excess ozone so that no one would accidentally be poisoned by it. So this, uh, this cyclopropyl-2-ene carboxylic acid is toxic at like microgram, milligram levels and they synthesized several hundreds of grams of it. That is terrifying. If you're ever making compounds that could be bioactive, definitely check ahead of time so that you're not making hundreds of grams of something that's toxic, really toxic in the milligram level. Yikes, that is awful. Stories from my PI. During his grad student years, another grad student tried and failed to outsuck a, a roughing pump. Why would you outsuck a pump? Why? Why would you do that? Like, there's not any good reason why you should outsuck a Oh my goodness. It collapsed his lungs and he was taken next door to the medical center. Another grad student was found unconscious next to an empty bottle of xenon. Putting one and one together, the guy who found him lifted him up to his legs to let the xenon out. So they're just like held him up by his legs, I guess. 
My PI pranked his advisor by inhaling helium-4 and saying, wow, helium-3 really does make your voice higher pitched than helium-4. More recently, a professor was making ammonia at his home by using the Haber-Bosch process. This is following H2 and N2. So this is basically like the reaction to make ammonia, except it requires really high temperatures. So he was doing it with uh, iron powder at around 500 degrees Celsius. His house exploded, killing himself and a neighbor walking their dog. That's terrible. Uh, I think you should leave making ammonia to the experts, and I don't know why you could possibly need to do that at home. You know, you might say it was for academic reasons, but if you're doing things for academic reasons, those are usually going to be done in an academic setting. My scariest lab accident was in grad school. I was attempting to synthesize a tritiated enzyme substrate. And so a tritiated is just, it's just saying that um, the molecule had tritium on it instead of a normal proton or deuterium at some position. This was 1987, so I've forgotten the details, but I was using a syringe to inject tritium water into my reaction vessel, but the syringe was somehow clogged. Okay, so what I'm going to say here is, if you've ever tried to use water in a syringe, for whatever reason, the syringe always gets stuck, and this is kind of a dumb flaw of those syringes. It's definitely an issue that those manufacturers need to sort out, because a lot of the time you want a syringe in aqueous solution, and the syringe just gets stuck. It's stupid. And the tritium water squirted into my face. I was sufficiently embarrassed by the incident that I did not report it to the my school's radiation officer. So if you ever get contaminated with anything radioactive at all, always report it to your radiation officer or whoever the appropriate authority is at your institution. Just because you think something's safe doesn't necessarily mean it is. And there's people who are experts who can figure this out for you. Something like this wasn't necessarily a user error. And even if it was a user error, I think we would all prefer to have people who are honest about their mistakes so that we can correct them instead of trying to punish people who make mistakes. And then on the other side of things, if you're one of the regulatory people and someone comes to you with an incident report, don't penalize them for coming to you. You should, you know, encourage people to do that. And I think penalizing people who come forward is not a good way to move forward. During my master's thesis, we found a dead earwig that crawled into one of my one of my NMR tubes. When I showed it to my mentor, he looked me dead in the eye and said, deuterate that. Yes, I, I'm sure that that dead earwig uh, replaced all of its protons with deuteriums. When I was an undergrad and doing my advanced organic chem course, we had to perform a reaction overnight. I think it was an Arbuzov reaction to produce a reagent for the horner wadsworth emmons uh, reaction. This is just an HWE reaction. This is alkylation of a phosphite with an alkyl halide. Anyway, for some reason, the organic chemistry department always cuts off the water flow into most of the labs after 6 p.m. I think this is a really stupid idea. Uh, if any of your labs shut the water off after a certain time, I'd like to know because that doesn't sound like a very safe thing to do where people could be running experiments overnight, including the undergrad labs. Overnight reactions under reflux are to be done in a separate underground lab. So my lab partners and I were, went there and placed our apparatus in one of the fume hoods, set the oil bath temperature at 130 degrees Celsius and left. Now, since they cut off the water flow into the other labs, we were there, uh, we will be there, We there will be a buildup of water pressure, especially underground. In my partner's setup, one of the hoses leading to her reflux condenser actually burst along uh, overnight. So the next day, we went to the underground lab and found the entire underground level flooded above, flooded to above our ankles. Oh my gosh, that's so much water. After two hours, with the help of some grad students, we managed to remove all of the flooding and miraculously no equipment, including our hot plates, uh, was damaged. As a punishment, the prof in charge gave us canisters of solvents, and we spent the next two hours scrubbing all the stains uh, from that lab. Yeah, I don't really think that's your fault. I think that's the university's fault for having really stupid protocol for water shutoff. If they're worried about people leaving water running and it's not like for a good purpose, people should just go check. That's really stupid. Be me, using cheap glassware. First mistake doing a reaction between hydrazine sulfate and sodium hydroxide to produce free base hydrazine in a one liter flask, making about 100 grams of free base. Here comes time to distill the mixture after reflux. Instead of using a sand bath like a normal person, I was impatient and used a flame to heat the distillation. Heating stuff with a flame always seems like a good idea until you realize it is not a good idea. The flask, which was about a foot above the bench, then decided to end its life. Cue a tidal wave of hydrazine going absolutely everywhere. Sit there for a moment realizing the thing that I did and proceed to dump three gallons of bleach onto every square inch of the place. Uh, this is a terrible story. Uh, free base hydrazine is no joke. You definitely need to be careful if you're working with hydrazine and it's way safer to handle it as a salt. One more story. My lab partner helped some other student clean up at the end of the day. He told her to get some acid to neutralize a beaker. Um, so he did. Uh, 
and he did so with half-concentrated HCl. As the first splash of the solution hit the beaker, a loud thump sound could be heard, and my partner stood there, drenched in liquid. Oh my gosh. It turned out that the beaker was full of concentrated NaOH and hydrogen peroxide, still warm from when it was used. That's terrifying. Um, the loud thump sound was the stuff evaporating instantly. <laughs> yeah, you should not con you should not quench uh, HCl with concentrated NaOH and and peroxide. That's terrifying. My lab partner did the right thing and washed his eyes right away, and then immediately, uh, and then himself immediately after after the shock. So his eyes and then the rest of his body. His safety glasses were milky everywhere the liquid went, and he had red spots all over his face for a few weeks. This should be a reminder of two things. One, safety measures are, are always not to be taken lightly. Everything has its use, and you can never know when you will need protection unexpectedly. This is absolutely the case, and if you're doing any home chemistry whatsoever, I know this case isn't about home chemistry, but I'm going to mention it here, you should have a fire extinguisher. You should have a fire extinguisher. Whether it's ABC or AB or otherwise, you should have a fire extinguisher and you should have a safety plan in place for when stuff goes wrong. Because it's not an if, it's a when. Label your stuff, all of it, especially if you have someone else using it or working with it. Absolutely, right? What if you get hit by a car and you have a big beaker full of some really corrosive, you know, freebase hydrazine, for instance? It would be really good if you labeled stuff. Losing your product is the least of your concerns if someone loses his eyesight or life because of you. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. There is a similar story often told at our biochemistry department. A few years ago, a PhD student was synthesizing some sodium phenylate. This is just by deprotonating phenol with some sodium base. Decided that it would be the best course of action um, to take the flask of phenol and melt it and then dump it in a large amount of sodium all at once. This is a terrible idea. Usually, if you wanted to do this, you should prepare like sodium methoxide or sodium ethoxide in a solution like methanol or ethanol, add in your phenol, and then concentrate it dry afterwards. Some say 100 grams, some say up to 500 grams of sodium. The bang was heard at least throughout the corridor, and a postdoc was able to put out the fire quite quickly. No one was seriously injured, but he was referred to at, from then moving forward as Boom Boom Gordon. Um, in high school, we were doing a water vapor distillation, which is just like um, like a steam distillation, we call it. And we're instructed to bring various uh, products like citrus fuchs, fruits, and such to extract their essential oils. They're just distilling essential oils. My classmates, normies, brought normal normal things like, you know, fruit, oranges, grapefruit, whatever. But I brought garlic. The assistant was reluctant, but at ADM, morbid curiosity got the best of him, and I was allowed to chop it up and load it into the distiller. The pleasant citrusy aromas were soon buried under the thickest, most violent, most insulting miasma of concentrated garlic extract dripping into a flask. My eyes were burning a bit, and then the whole class of 20 people was sniffing and laughing simultaneously. I covered up the output of the flask because the smell was getting overbearing, and people were completely complaining, but it was the most, it was more performative than useful. The whole building reeked of garlic the whole day, and the other students, as well as the professors, were disgruntledly inquiring who was responsible for that attack on their senses and why they were sniffing it. I, an innocent high schooler, was watching the school burn, numb to the stench. The technician who came in with a cold was now cured, and his sinuses were as good as ever. Now, I'm a computational chemist grad student, and this is my still my fondest memory. Yeah, that's definitely a good story, and if you ever have to distill foul-smelling stuff, it's good to definitely have a trap set up so that nobody else has to smell that awful, awful smell. Bleach works well. I've worked with astatine-211, that's an isotope of astatine, with a 7.2 hour half-life, they're saying, and luckily never had an accident, but my old professor, a 2 meter tall viking, worked on distilling off astatine-211 from, from an aluminum bismuth plate that was used for making the stuff. They were wearing full face gas masks, but he had a massive beard, and that didn't fit the mask. So guess what? One day something happened, and it shot out the astatine and carrier gas into his massive beard, so all of that had to be promptly cut away. In the end, no lasting ill effects. And hey, I love the stuff. Just wait two days and it's all gone. Self-cleaning. Take that, tar chemists. P.S. You don't know the pain until you've had to take one microliter samples of radioactive chloroform with a micropipette. Yeah, I don't like the idea of having to do anything radioactive, let alone one microliter samples. That sounds absolutely terrible. My bachelor's project supervisor had a dispute with one of the janitorial staff, and one of his thiol works in progress accidentally got knocked over one night. Yeah, okay, if you're not a chemist and you know anything about chemicals, it's that if you don't know what they are, leave them alone. And most of the time, even if you are a chemist and you're not sure about the hazards of a random chemical you come across, it's probably still best to leave it alone. 
Uh, so this guy accidentally knocked it over one night. It soaked into the floor, bench, and cupboard woodwork. The place smelled like it for literally decades. It was something along the lines of a ring thioether used as a chelating agent for transition metals. When he ceased doing research and his lab was passed along to another researcher, I gather that they had to strip the place and refurnish it. Even after all that time, it wasn't possible to kill the smell. Sulfur is unrelenting. It will uh, impact your career, and it will also impact your nostrils. A colleague of mine was cleaning glassware with piranha solution, which is just a mixture of um, sulfuric acid and peroxide. While cleaning a frit, he put it on top of what he thought was a beaker of aqueous waste. It turns out that it was a beaker of organic waste, and if you know anything about this, it's that organic will absolutely get oxidized by peroxide in the presence of acid. Never thought that an essentially open container could explode that violently. Everything inside the fume hood was in pieces. Shards of glass stuck inside the safety glass. So this, that's terrifying. The colleague was insanely lucky leaving, uh, leaving with just a few cuts. Yeah, seriously, it's no joke if you combine peroxide and acid with organics, especially because people have acetone in a lab. That could be super, super dangerous, no matter how open the system is. Explosions can definitely still happen. And so uh, if uh, you didn't get your comment in this video, it might show up in a future one. I had to move probably like half of the awesome, amazing comments that you guys left from the last video to a future one. Um, if you like this style of comment, make sure you leave a like and comment and subscribe. And I hope you have a great day.